Hello everybody and welcome back to the Triple Jump podcast. It's a video game podcast. My name is Ben. My name is Peter. And my name is Ashton. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Hello. How are you doing? All Good. right. Yeah? Good yes. and all right yes. between us. Good. How are you doing? Yeah. Doing okay. Okay. Good, uh, all right, and okay. Okay, just fine. <laughs> I came in here and I turned on the light and our famously one remaining bulb yeah. gave sort of a death rattle. Oh. Where it was like, oh, it will soon <laughs> don't be. don't know if I'm going to do it today. Almost pitch black in here. Um, He's still down there. Dead Island, Island 2, the spider, spider down there. house. House. House, yes. <laughs> house, the spider. Uh, very excitingly, we're at Insomnia right now. Right mm -hmm. now. We're recording this early uh, on, the, on Wednesday. So if any of the things we talk about today are updated, then we'll correct it next week. Maybe, if we remember. But uh, just bear that in mind that this podcast is uh, recorded a few days before you're listening to it. If you happen to be listening to a podcast on release day mm. and also going to on a your way to con insomnia. today, a yeah. conference, then uh, find us. We'll be we'll walking find around. us. We'll Are be we constantly Billy? moving. Constantly. You'll never catch us. We could us. take Billy. We've taken Billy before, but he's getting a bit he's delicate a bit now, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I'm worried about his him. His hair might come off. Or yeah. We're definitely going to lose one of his eyebrows on he's the show He's got a loose floor. guitar as Every well. Look at that receding yeah. hairline. Well, don't, don't get it out. Sorry. I'm just going to adjust his eyebrow a bit because he looks. I want him to look a bit surprised. Ooh, me? Lose it? Oh, he's, oh, oh, he's my fallen. God. He, That's what happens when you get old. He's you prone falls. to falls now, unfortunately. My granddad had a fall the other day, broke oh, his he? hip. Yeah, he's Seriously? had a partial hip replacement. Oh, bloody hell. He's Jesus, all right. Peter. He said the food in hospital was horrible. Okay, well, yeah. that was the worst bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, bless him. Well, he's I hope fine. he's. I hope yeah. he's doing the, the Dick Van Dyke, you know, the hill click. Yeah, soon. oh, yeah. he will be. I'm Spry sure. as anything. <laughs> uh, no, we're not sponsored by... Heel replacements. Heel, hip replacements. We're not even at that point in the podcast no. yet. No. I was committing to it to then circle back and go, ah, I got you. We're not talking about the sponsor but yet. we are sponsored by. But then I said heel instead of hip. Mm. And now I've just got it all confused in my brain. Wow. I've got the actual sponsor. Yeah. Here, the real sponsor. Are you guys ready for this? Yes. So this is, no peeking. I can't read it so small. Okay, me neither. This is a collaboration between British brand of hair styling products for men, Brill Cream, the Team GB Olympic diving team right. and developer Arrowhead, who have all pulled their resources to bring to your attention a brand new game mechanic, Gel Divers 2. Right. This is coming to Hell Divers 2. Right. And what you do essentially, people love diving in that game, right? Throwing your body off cliffs and diving out the way of yeah. danger and the ragdoll physics. Bit people of hell love as that. Well. They yeah. love it, yeah. So, what they're going to do is build in each map a custom sort of tower that you can go up the stairs all the way to the mm. top. And there's just a big pool of brill cream hair gel at the bottom. Sticky. And you can go splodge. I'd, I would like to watch someone splodge into a pool of hair gel mm. um, in terms of the, the, the goopy viscous splodge. Yeah. Yes. But then you would watch them drown. Yeah. They wouldn't come up again if they would. Well, the exciting thing is that it's but not it's just a video you. Game, so it's fine. It's yeah. not just you who's watching them drown. It's Tom Daly. A oh. British Olympic diver. He, mm -hmm. he he stands up there and he applauds you. Drown. Is he a diver or a swimmer? I can't he's remember. A diver. He's a diver. He's a diver. Yeah, he's yeah. A diver. Okay. Uh, so he'll be up there clapping. Is he still on the Team GB team? I think so. He's, I feel like he's he been might, doing that for a long time. No, yeah, surely he, he's retired now. His last one might have been his last... I don't know. He's an old man, 28. There's well, no yeah, way he'll ever dive again. When you're again. an Olympian, you quit at like 28. Well, I, don't, I, I can still see videos of him... In pools and going diving. I'm sure he's still in pools, off, but he I'll never touch water no, I just again. Mean he might not be an Olympian anymore. He's like tr in a training pool, still jumping mm, off maybe. stuff. Maybe. Not sure. You, you can maybe take Paris the dive out of the man. Maybe last one, I don't mm. know. Mm. Mm. But either way, he's going to be there it, on Mars or wherever it is that you are mm. going, yeah. great job. You d don't drown. Democracy. Oh, it's pretty cream, like um, really... It's like slimy then. Well, they do lots of different brands. Yeah. So they definitely do gel, right. but they also do like actual hair cream and stuff right. like that as well. It's like a range of products. I only ever see it in barbers. I've never, yeah. I never purchase it. Don't need it. I think it's associated quite a lot with the, the slick back yeah. hairstyles yeah. of the sort of mid 20th century. Yeah. That yes. kind of thing. And also uh, all the boy bands off of the early 2000s mm. as well. Yeah. yeah. With their super glue hard hair. Yeah. It would be really cool if that were real, but unfortunately Gel Divers 2 is not real. Oh. Ah. 
Um, um, so sorry, Brill Cream. One day you will sponsor us and uh, we'll do a video where our hair is all just vertical. Oh, I'd love mm. to do that, actually. Yeah, yeah I'd love to see the height hair. I could get. A Jedward. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that would be great. The reach. Yeah. Uh, we are, in fact, sponsored by our wonderful patrons over at patreon.com forward slash team triple jump. If you go and support us there, uh, not only can you ask questions on this podcast, but you also get access to worst games and weirdest games before anybody else and exclusive access to episodes of Rules Boss and Main Menu. New episodes coming very soon. Mm -hmm. Triple Jump em Up is our website. That's where you can find links to everything we do. TripleJumpShop.com if you want to get some lovely fashionable merchandise that is just released. Any of us wearing a new merch today? No, not new merch. Not new merch. Just in comfies today. Yeah. yeah. All wearing merch, just comfy, comfy yeah. old merch. Um, and of course, patreon.com forward slash team triple jump if you want to go uh, support us there. A few things out on the channel this week, guys. Yeah. Can I just add yeah. that's not to imply that the new merch isn't comfy? No, the it's new just merch old is faithful. comfy. It's yeah. just sometimes you just want to throw on the thing that you've well, exactly. owned for I'm four saying years. Comfies is in like it's just yeah. It's I wanted there. my mm -hmm. zip up today, not my pullover hoodie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, what was the question? What's out this What's week? What's out, out this, this week, week Peter? Peter? Uh, there's a worst games ever out this week. It's McFarlane's Evil Prophecy, which is just the best name of any game ever really made. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a rubbish game. Um, <laughs> it's Oh, it's spooky. Or is it? No, it's not. No. Uh, oh. So you're going to have a great time. Um, yeah. It was baffling, really. It a baffling experience. Very oh. bad. Mm. And you can find out all about it now. Yeah. If you're a patron. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, if you're not. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, we're at Insomnia. And that's the other thing mm -hmm. that, we're, that we're stressing, as well as all the lists and wonderful other things that went on, to, on the channel and all the live streams this week as well. Yeah. Uh, including a couple of live streams of games we'll be talking about in Review Corner a bit later on. Indeed. Should we get up with question one? Yes, let's. Yep, it's from Big Money Bobby Vegas, <laughs> who says, Dearest Bap, Larian have decided to move on from Baldur's Gate with no plans for DLC for BD3 or, indeed, a sequel. Are you sad at this news, or are you excited to see what the studio will do with a new IP? Wishing you health, happiness, and ten-pound notes. Oh, uh, BMBV. Thank, Thank you, BMBV. you. Thank you, very Bobby much. Vegas. Got a little snippet here from a Destructoid article that re itself references an IGN article. Uh, Larry and CEO Sven v Vinker. Vink, Vink, Vinkler, Vinkler, Sven Vinkler, Vinkler emphasized oh no. Oh no, in, a in a tweet that this move is entirely Larian's choice and that, quote, Wizards of the Coast really did their best and have been a great licensor for us, letting us do our thing. Uh, speaking to IGN, he said that after the overwhelmingly positive reception of the game, Larian started working on DLC and ideas for a sequel, but quickly ran into a serious problem. Another quote here. You could see the team was doing it because everybody felt like we had to do it, but it wasn't really coming from the heart. And we're very much a studio all about being from the heart, Love that. he told IGN. Part of the drain on the team's enthusiasm, he said, was that the studio had all these ideas of new combat to try out that were not compatible with Dungeons and Dragons 5e 5th edition. Mm. So there you go. Those are some reasons as to why this has happened. Um, but to answer BMBV's question... I'm not sad as such at this news. I think it's a shame for um, Baldur's Gate and Dungeons and & Dragons video game fans to think that this studio that came along and did it so well aren't sticking around to just do more of the same great stuff. You know, this game absolutely took the world by storm and mm -hmm. by surprise as well to some extent. Um, but I personally am not sad. I think this is a great thing for them to do go off and do, you know, another hopefully great game without being constrained by, you know, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition um, and and other things. Um, I mean, he, he, he makes it clear it wasn't Wiz Wizards of the Coast who said either that we don't want you to do any more or oh if you stick around you're gonna have to do this and this and this and you know like I think really it was more like the whip. how much money they were going to have to pay them for that's the next game. yeah i've heard that as well that the that ha it's you know part of the you know the price of the license and so on but mm -hmm. um it, it certainly doesn't sound like that they felt constrained specifically by wizard wizards of the coast in a sort of a oppressive way i think it's more it's carrot rather than stick and i to me, it, it comes across as though they've got all these ideas of what they want to do um, and they would rather go off and perhaps do that in an environment or in a with an agreement that is less constrained. Um, so I think this is great for them. I think they can like show us what they got in uh, in another 
capacity and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. I would love more Baldur's Gate mm-hmm. 3, but if I'm not going to get any more, that's fine because I loved what I did play and I feel like I got a lot of expi- like a good experience out of Baldur's Gate 3. So I don't mind that they're not making any DLC for it. Um would have been nice, but if I'm not going to have it, nothing's been taken away from me really, so yeah. it's fine. Um I re- just really like the way Larian have talked about this in that if the developers didn't want to do it, they weren't just going to force it through and like get more money from people. Yeah. Um, Larian have been very transparent and honest about their their views on things. Every time they've won an award, they've talked about how it should be the developers that are praised and it, they should be paid more and shareholders do nothing but ruin games. And I think that's great. Um but I am excited to see what they'll do next. I don't know if they'll stick with the fantasy sphere or if they'll go somewhere else. I think that maybe, like they were saying with the combat stuff, if they're constrained so much by what D&D is, maybe they'll do something completely different in a similar vein. It will still be fantasy forward and it maybe will still be a similar RPG to what Baldur's Gate 3 mm-hmm. was. But maybe it'll just be either real-time combat or something completely different. But I'm excited to see what they do. I think that Larian have proved themselves to be a fantastic studio and it would be nice to see what else they've got up their sleeves. Um, Their chainmail sleeves, of course. Um, Wizard sleeves. Wizard sleeves. But yeah, I think it's been... I think it's... Everything they've said about this has made complete sense and I think it just seems... It it screams positive place to work, which is nice. Yeah. Mm. That's true. Yeah. The, their boss wears plate armor as well. Yes, he does. So he'll, pr- right. he'll yeah. protect them yeah, as, exactly. as much as he can. Um, yeah, I'm, I I finished Baldur's Gate 3 and I didn't feel the need for any more. Mm-hmm. I can totally understand why people who are so enraptured with that game would, would love to see an expansion or more content. Although, given the insane amount of content there is in that game, I think it speaks volumes that the people who really enjoy it have started like three, four, five Mm -hmm. different characters and are quite happy to just play through the game in different ways Mm -hmm. and they're experiencing it, you know, whole new narrative angles and uh, perspectives. Uh, So I don't think it's a great loss that there'll be no expansions or even necessarily a sequel. Uh, People love those characters as well. And I know that there there are maybe a couple of characters or party members for whom some people felt like maybe they got slightly shafted in their story without mentioning specifics and would maybe like to see that expanded upon so certain characters can have their happy ending uh but mm. and i feel like that would be a shame not to not to give those characters that there's definitely a bit i don't know if it was in it when you played the like epilogue yes they're the post kind of the camp they added that, that you didn't go they? To. Yeah. yeah and that does kind of give some people a bit more of a happy ending but mm-hmm. yeah it would be nice to to have have it maybe expanded upon mm-hmm. if if possible. Uh, Larian previously worked on Divinity Original Sin. In fact, I believe the Divinity series, citation needed, might actually be Larian's original IP. So I would not be shocked if they did maybe a Divinity Original Sin three. And because for me, one of my main one of the main reasons I didn't enjoy Baldur's Gate three as much as other people was the combat, which obviously adhered very strictly to Dungeons and Dragons. Was it five? Five E, five E, yeah. um, being able to have total agency over their combat might be a bit of a risk because it it could be rubbish rather yeah. than basing it in something they know works. But also, it could potentially appeal a bit more to to me specifically. One thing that cannot be denied though is that they are fantastic world builders and writers, and the way that that game worked from a narrative perspective was phenomenal. And if they can keep that, but maybe change the combat slightly, then they may well have another killer game on their hands. And if it's a series that they own the rights to, then they'd be mad not to not to give it another try mm. and and have have full ownership over that. But I can't see them straying from RPGs because that's like that's their bread and butter. That's mm-hmm. what that's what they do really yeah. well. Um, so there we are. Those are my thoughts on that. Mm. Well. I think it's time for a segment that um, I came up with last week and I'm hoping you guys will like. It's called um, What We Play In. You've got to stop coming up with segments. Sorry, sorry. I wrote it down. Oh, you did. (laughs) 
It's what we play in time. Time to talk about the games. What we have been playing. Peter Austin, what have you been playing? Played a few things uh, this week. Two of them I've already talked about in previous podcasts. And one of them I can't talk about right now because it's going to be in Review Corner. Oh, But oh. I'll tell you all of them anyway. Uh, I have played a bit. I tried some um, Battlefront 2 online. Oh, yeah. And it was just crap. It's crap, Yeah, isn't it? I was getting like visual, I haven't gone back to it, yeah. visual glitches and like people were kind of moving around like lagging but i don't think it was connectivity issue like it wasn't it wasn't that i had bad internet maybe they had bad internet mm. but i i get the feeling it was more perhaps a server problem mm. I, I don't know shrug took me a while to get into a game as well um and uh what was i just going to say then something about um the review corner game no no something about battlefront but i don't know anyway um I don't think I'll be playing any more of that okay. multiplayer. Um, if anything, it's made me want to just go back. I never thought I'd say this. It's made me want to go to the modern Battlefront mm. games. Oh, wow. You were quite a big fan of the multiplayer. Yeah, I was actually. I, pl I put a lot of hours into both of those. Um, and, you know, I think it's partly I just like um, I just like the Frostbite engine, quite frankly. It's very pretty. Yeah, mm. you know, I'm not like that keen on EA in general and their practices, especially, you know, in relation to Battlefront. Mm. Um, but it's very, very pretty, um, that engine. And uh, it's nice to explore those worlds in crisp, shiny, possibly ray traced, Ooh. I don't know, definition. <laughs> um, I've played some more Tomb Raider as well. Tomb Raider 2, I'm on now. Uh, went and did the, the mansion level from Tomb Raider 2 as well, which I'd forgotten to do at the start of uh, that campaign. Um, and spent flipping ages trying to find a way to get through this door. Uh, th there's a door I couldn't open. I can't remember if it had a, had a keyhole next to it or not. I think it did. Um, and I, I like went from top to bottom in the mansion, went into the hedge maze, found like a little secret tunnel and stuff. And eventually I was like, I'm gonna have to Google this. I don't know how I'm getting into this room. And like, you can't get into it until you've completed the campaign. Oh, <laughs> or it, it may even be that you, you actually come to the house, like come back to the house as part of the story. I don't really know how it works, but yeah. So I wasted a lot of time doing that. Um, but the third thing I've played, I'm gonna talk about shortly. Uh, and that's Dragon's Dogma 2. But I'm gonna... Keep fingers on lips until we go over to the quiet review corner. Mm. Say anything. So that's what I've been playing this week. I've only played one thing, and it's Final Fantasy VII. Mm. I'm 50 hours in. I'm on chapter 11, and I have a list of things I'd like to talk about without any context. <laughs> okay. I've got some pros and cons. Go on. Pro. The story is popping off, and I'm enjoying what's going on. Yeah. Con. The bouncy mushrooms kept getting me lost. Pro, yeah. the beautiful the locations are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um con, there's flying mini games. Um pro, someone sounds like Simba now. Con, the Navi are here from Avatar? Mm -hmm. What's that about? What? I don't understand. Um another con, Robo Chad. That upset me. Um a pro, there's a car. The car was fun to drive in. A con, getting out of the car takes ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I kept getting lost. A lot in there's they've suddenly introduced verticality yep. and um, just routes that do not necessarily make the most sense and I keep getting lost but I'm now done both of those areas and never have to return which is nice. Fantastic. Um, it's a good mini game uh, compilation is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Everything is a mini game. There's a lot of mini games. Every single thing is a mini game. And everything is like, oh, can you rank up to rank three? And I'm like, I'm giving nope. you the bare <laughs> minimum, babe. I'm going to achieve it. And that's about it. The flying mini games, I had to get my boyfriend to do one of them because I couldn't They're do it. They're pretty tough. They are, they are annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I just, there's a lot, a lot going on. And at one point when Robo Chad was introduced, there was like, about four pages of text explaining a mini game to mm. me and it was too late at night and I refused to read it and I just went in and hoped for the best managed to win the mini games that you have to do with it but I didn't know what I was doing I was just doing whatever I thought maybe was correct and winning and I was like I have no right to win this mm. and every time you go to another one another text box pops up and tells you about a new thing that they've added and I'm like you've got to stop yeah, yeah. <laughs> enough is enough I did um, I've also played some Final Fantasy yeah. which I'll talk more about in a second but I I went back and did that side content that you're 
describing. Mm. And the story I, part of it's really good, yeah, and I is. really liked it. It's just a shame I had to do this weird other thing. Mm-hmm. I, I had to. Like I too, my eyes just glazed over when it gave like <laughs> yeah. six pages of yeah. instructions. I was like, huh? And I hit a brick wall because I needed to do all of them and obviously it ramps up in difficulty and I mm. sort of just muddled my way through but the first But I figured two. out on the third one that you could just get it to do the Auto stats select. for you. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh. That's what I ended up doing. But when I was looking on Reddit, everyone was like, it is way too late in the game for it to be introducing like entirely for, new mechanics like, like this. For like four things as well. Like yeah. There's four little mini games you have to do and I had to, and you expect me to read three pages of text. It's a lot. I'm not going it to do it. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've been enjoying it and I think that it's really interesting. But the amount of times I've sat there like positively baffled about what's going on in the story and I've had to be like, is this in the original game? To my boyfriend, he's like, no. no. And I'm like, what is it? what's going on? Why am I here? Why are the Navi here? I'm confused. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I don't know. I'm enjoying it, but I'm just... It's a big game, and it just yeah. doesn't need to be this big. I know that they're like... Every time I do a mini game, Ben's like, oh, this was in... This was in the original game, and I'm like, but did it need to be in this game? Sounds like if they'd not done all of that, they could have just released one full version of Final (laughs) Fantasy VII Remake from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the thing as well. I'm acutely aware that I'm going to get to the end of the game, and I'm still not going to finish the story, and I'm going to have to wait another few years and then play another 50-hour game. But yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, and I'm probably the reason I'm probably like slogging through it is because I'm doing everything in every area. Partially because I just don't want to have to come back. There's certain areas where I'm like, I don't want to have to relearn where everything is in this area and how to get around. There was an entire portion of one of the maps that I was like, I can't get here. Like, I'm, I must have to wait for like a door to open for me to be able to get around there. And then I just happened to be bouncing on some mushrooms and then eventually found my way in. And I was like, that was not, how was I ever supposed to figure this out? Mm. Because obviously, because when you're looking at the map, if you've not been there, it's all fogged out. Right. So you can't see if there's like a way in. And I was like tracing along the outside on my chocobo, like trying to find my way in. And it's also, I need them to stop making the Moogle thing so annoying. I don't want to deal with these weirdos <laughs> and they're just making them annoying. Coupo. Mm-hmm. Coupo. Anyway, that's what I play this week. Right. I also played Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Um, I got tattooed on Saturday. Um, in then, real life. In real life. <laughs> and then I had a couple of days off just to feel sorry for myself and mm-hmm. recover. And uh, so I just sat there and played through the... I, I went back and did like all of the side stuff. Um, just so you complete... I completed like the world, so-called world intel for each region. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't... I haven't like maxed out all the mini games and stuff like that because... I skill issue and patience really as much as anything else um and then i thought well i should probably finish this game then and i have now finished this game i did it oh it's done is it? i've finished the game the final two chapters 14 chapters in Mm -hmm. total are are very linear okay so you will i mean the, the the penultimate one is a lot longer than the final one but basically it's just like one whole one roller coaster ride from start to finish towards the end of chapter 13 so you're you're pretty close to the end now you're very close um, We're doing it. I will, because d- d- anything I say w- could be construed as a spoiler, mm-hmm. regardless of of how of how I describe it. Uh, all I'll say is that I have finished it. I enjoyed the ride, and um, it, it has much like the first part, just made me want to replay the original game. Mm-hmm. So I've got that downloading at the moment. Mm-hmm. So I'll play through that again for fun. Uh, definitely some decisions in there that I'm I don't agree with necessarily. But as we talked about on the lead up to release, that doesn't like make me mad or anything. I'm I'm excited to see what their vision is and where it ends up going. And I can always play the original. I will always have that. Um, a truly epic game in it, to a fault almost. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> there's there's a lot going on in that game, and uh, I'm sad that I have to wait for five years for the next one. And I truly hope that they stick the landing with whatever it is that they are trying to do. So that's what I will say for that. It's done. I've finished it. Uh, apart from that, I played some more Redfall. Oh, yeah. Turns out that open, that map that you play in isn't the only area of the game. Oh. I completed that area of the game and thought, oh, my God, I've nearly finished Redfall. And it was like, here's another area. Oh, wow. Do it all again. Mm. It's just a thoroughly unremarkable, buggy, 
uh, mess shooter like sandbox shooter. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just yeah. just rubbish. I've got lots of clips of funny glitches where is the story interesting? No, no. I've I've Shocking. honestly I reached the point where I was kind of just skipping over stuff because I was yeah. like I just want to shoot more things with mm -hmm. with you know some TV on in the background. So I don't know if I'll return to that because I've been playing South Park Snow Day, which I'll talk about in Review Corner in just a second. Uh, that's a lie. Spoiler, South Park Snow Day is dreadful, and I'd actually rather play Redfall. So maybe oh I will go back to Redfall. We'll see. Should we go to this uh, this corner, Let, Peter? Let's hear how dreadful it is. It's going to be spicy. And here we are in the review corner. Oh, lovely. It's nice to be here. Hello, Ben. Hello, Peter. Um, so you have been playing, as you just alluded to, some South Park. I certainly have. Before we get started, yes. this is a blanket statement that applies to both of us. Indeed. Both of the codes that we were provided with that we're going to talk about today, that being uh, South Park Snow Day and Dragon's Dogma 2, uh, were provided by the respective developer slash publishers. So thank you to THQ Nordic and uh, Capcom. Yep. It's Capcom, isn't it? It is. Yes. Uh, for providing those codes. But per ASA guidelines, we have to disclose that this is now technically per their guidelines, an ad. However, there was no financial compensation in exchange for coverage. We're just talking about because we got a code, you mm. know, the deal. Yeah. So let me tell you about South Park Snow Day. Please do. This is a new game, what has just come out this mm -hmm. week. A terrible snowstorm has hit the town of South Park, causing the school to be closed. So the school kids get right into one of their fantasy role plays. Of course they do. So this is a similar um, sort of setting to... What was it called? The Stick of Truth. Stick of Truth, yeah. The Fractured But Whole with More Superhero. Mm -hmm. This is very much their fantasy thing. thing. Cartman is... All of the kids, uh, the, the main characters are playing the characters that they did. You know, like Princess Kenny. The and, same ones, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you play as a human taking on the evil elves. You start by creating your character in a relatively simplistic character creator. Right. You don't have a huge amount of cosmetic choices, but you do get access to some in the hub area. You can spend uh, in-game currency to buy some more outfits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how you are fighting, uh, melee-wise, you have the likes of a, uh, a set of daggers or a sword and a shield, and you also have a ranged attack as well, and you can have a bow and arrow, a staff, or a wand, and they all do different types of attacks. Right. What you essentially are doing in this game is fighting through a series of areas, mm -hmm. killing everything in it, maybe picking up an item, bumping into uh, a memorable character or whatever, and then returning to the hub. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, it's, it's not linear in the sense that it's a story you start and play through all the way. You're coming back to the hub after every time. It, it's called a run, basically. Right. And from the menu, it looks like there's going to be five. And okay. each of them is split into different sections. Uh, in addition to those basic attacks, you also have cards, cards, cards. Hell yes. You love them. Love them. So whenever you start a different run, you will be presented with uh, various cards for temporary buffs for that run. Right. So these can be things like uh, your ability to escape an area by farting up into the sky because right. it's South Park. Yeah, very funny. Might draw enemies in, damaging them with fart power. Mm -hmm. Or the healing beacon that you could throw down on the ground will damage enemies that are nearby. Right. And I should also say that in addition to your melee attacks and ranged attacks, you also have a couple of powers that you can switch between that are, that are able to be triggered. And those are two of them. Mm -hmm. You have another thing as well called a, a a bs card right which i is not what it's called in game it's called bullflip right the full name okay and whenever it's triggered by either you or the enemy a, a voice ever goes bullflip and it's basically the equivalent of the kids going hey no you're cheating that's not fair that's that's bullflip oh right it's like a special mega power that you can use a certain amount of times in any given game right but as you go through these runs you will occasionally bump into npcs who will offer you new cards um, that you can add to continue buffing what you've what you've got going on, or you can spend toilet paper, which is the currency. Again, very funny mm -hmm. because it's you know everyone's snowed in and toilet paper is a real commodity. And everyone's panic buying. Well, just like it, yeah, exactly, like COVID. Just like COVID, you can use that toilet paper to either reshuffle the cards you're being offered or to upgrade the rarity and the potency of a card that's that's presented to you. Mm -hmm. So by the time you finish a run, you're not 
you're not going to be uh, using these these cards anymore. They, right. They're gone, basically. Okay. But it's just for the purpose of that run, so it's it's worth doing. At the end of each run, there's a boss, and there's like some cutscenes in there as you go, and uh, so on and so forth. It is four-player co-op. Right. That's the main attraction here. So you'll be running through with uh, either three friends or three AI CPU mm -hmm. controlled people. They will uh, be automatically assigned. And uh, if you if you don't have any people with you, you have to play with with bots. Basically, there will always be four of you running around doing these things. Yeah. So that is the the basic gist of of how the game plays. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it's really boring right the, so i've heard the combat is not good yeah you're it basically boils down to just mashing the attack button and flailing in the direction of enemies there's no lock on button mm -hmm. so for example the sword and shield if you have that equipped if you hold down the attack button you'll hold up your shield to block but you're then locked in place and can only strafe and move forwards and backwards okay so if you're not locked on to someone and they're in front of you and then they decide to go round you. The block is pointless. Right. You can't. You can't react with them. Yeah. And oftentimes you'll go towards an enemy, start fighting them, and then your attacks will be so aggressive you'll shoot past them, mm -hmm. and the camera will stay behind you. And then you've got to manually. To, it's just. It doesn't feel good to play. Yeah. And as I said, it's really boring because you just do the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's also not very funny. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is only going to appeal to South Park fans. I am a South Park fan, but it doesn't, outside of like a, an actual bespoke bit of animation at the start of the game, which is done in the South Park style, 2D, yeah. it doesn't really feel like it's doing anything of its own. Whereas South Park, The Stick of Truth and The Fractured But Whole were telling their own story and creating their own lore and stuff that would actually feed back into the show. Yeah. This feels like it just references stuff from the show. It doesn't actually do anything itself. New and interesting. Which is a real shame. Mm. And obviously because it's South Park and it's poking fun at itself, it's poking fun at the fact that it's a video game yeah. and there are kids there. You know, basically the things you're beating up are just, like the elves are just kids wearing elf ears, mm -hmm. you know, and costumes and stuff. They'll say stuff like, I don't want to play anymore. Or, oh, I'm bored now. I want to go home. And it's like... Ugh. That's too close to the bone. Yeah. That's too close to the truth. We always talk about how in games like Saints Row, they poke fun of the fact that it's a video game. Like, I don't know, collect 20 of these or whatever. I don't care. Yeah. And it's like, it makes it worse. Mm -hmm. It makes it worse that you're drawing attention to the thing that you're making me do is boring. Yeah. So when you've got characters in game flippantly saying, I'm bored, I want to go home. <laughs> I don't want to play anymore. And you're bored and you don't want to play anymore. It makes it way worse. Yeah. There's also the like there's a big stylistic change that I don't think doesn't work, which is that it's 3D instead of 2D. Right. Okay. I think actually the style adapts pretty well. Mm -hmm. Like when they're animated, you know, talking to you and stuff, they do emote very much like they would if they were 2D. So it's not too jarring seeing that graphical change for me. Mm -hmm. But there are some additional stuff that doesn't really work, like the fact it's in 3D when you're making your character and you wear a hoodie and a cape, for example. The hood of the hoodie pokes through the cape oh, and it like right. clips through. Yeah. It looks a bit crap. If you're wearing a hat, your hair can clip through it. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? Yeah. If you're going to go for this style, you've got to pay attention to those details because mm -hmm. that's not a problem in 2D. Yeah. In 3D, that does become an issue. Um, and also the AI people that you've got with you aren't the, the, the sharpest tools in the shed. I had them get stuck at the bottom of pits and die and then not get out of the pits mm -hmm. again and stuff. So it's... It's a really baffling one. Yeah. And it's not it's not a good game, but it's also not a horrendous game. I feel like if you have four mates and you're all big South Park fans, you'll enjoy the references that are in this game. You'll get right. something out of it. And it is also a budget title. It's only $24.99. Mm -hmm. So it's not a full release. But it it misses the mark massively for me as a big South Park fan and as a fan of the Stick of Truth and um, the Fractured Butthole. Yeah. This does not hit. In remotely the same way and I, th I feel right. like that's that's a real shame uh, but it is out right now on PlayStation 5 Xbox Series Switch and PC mm. if you want to go and grab it brilliant well uh, should we talk about Dragon's Dogma 2 yes please okay well I have played uh, some hours I've streamed it as well as played in my own time uh, and the footage we're looking at now is actually if you're watching on video um, is just from my stream mm -hmm. um, it was 
We we talk about this later in the podcast, right? And then we have now already recorded that. And so I don't want to uh, cover too much of the same ground. But I will touch on the fact that it's frustrating that in this game you can't start two separate save files. Yeah. Um, so uh, that is why we're we're looking at the, the same stuff that you've already seen on stream. Um, but regardless, Dragon's Dogma 2, let's talk about that. It's um, a follow-up to the game from 2015, was it, I think? Um, oh, citation needed. It's a long or while ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, you are once again playing as the Arisen, but the Arisen is a title. It's not a specific, so you're not the same character. Right, um, okay. So uh, there is an interesting thing going on in this game, uh, which is revealed right at the beginning, which is that there are apparently two Arisens. Now the Arisen, Ooh is essentially the the nemesis of the dragon that plagues this fantasy world okay um and in a sort of a strange way they're almost kind of chosen by the dragon and then they, they become intertwined with each other and they're destined to to kind of fight with each other mm -hmm. um and at the very beginning of the game uh, it becomes very clear that you are the arisen and the pawns who come from a different world will obey you as the arisen and they they can see that that's who you are uh, and they can identify you as being special in that way. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, there is a uh, the, the leader of the nation, the, the current king, is being hailed as the current Arisen. So you have, you have been launched into this interesting situation where you know that you definitely are the Arisen, mm -hmm. um, but the king is also claiming to be, and there can be only one, apparently. Yes. It's not possible for there to even have been two in the first place. It's not if there are two, they have to fight. It's mm -hmm. like, no, there's only one. Right. So you essentially know that this is some kind of pretender. Uh -huh. um, and so that is kind of what sets you off uh, on your adventure. Um, I haven't played too much of the story so far because you are in this very large open fantasy RPG world mm -hmm. and there is always stuff to do which is nice um, and on top of there always being stuff to do that you perhaps want want to go and do uh, there is also, also always stuff to do that you don't that I don't necessarily want to be doing all the time. One of those things is traveling around everywhere on foot. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of those things as well is faffing around with your inventory, um, which I'll get to shortly. Uh, but the point being, I haven't played a great deal more of the story beyond the kind of inciting events. Um, so that's where we are. Um, in terms of gameplay, you start the game and create a character with a pretty impressive um, character creation, mm -hmm. uh, creation suite. Um, it comes down to even strange details like uh, there's like a, a tab for teeth and when you select it, your character does this great big toothy smile <laughs> and the great. top row of teeth uh, next to it in the UI, there is a series of ticks and you can untick as many as you like oh and the teeth God. will be gone. Uh, it's really kind of horrible, but brilliant. Uh, you can put multiple tones of color in your hair and choose how much they blend with each other. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, There are um, other races as well, kind of furry-esque characters. Okay. Uh, they, can, they kind of had like, like cat features. Um, so you create your own character. Um, and then very shortly after that, you also create your own pawn, which is the one of the unique selling points of the Dragon's Dogma series, as it now is. Um, for those who don't know, a pawn is a, a character who will follow you around and be your assistant. Um, and you can have a party of up to four, that is you plus three other pawns. Um, you only get to create one of them and the others are hired um, in from other players, which is a really interesting thing. And you can, of course, share your pawn code with other people and so they can hire your character specifically i of course made our boy billy ray walrus absolutely uh it was difficult to do actually i of course chose the the animal man class but um one of the only fur colors i couldn't do was pink oh, no. so i had to cover him in some humongous tattoos oh god Just, i selected the the block square tattoo and scaled it up oh, so it covered his entire the body classic wrestling exactly. uh, creation suite solution yes uh, if people check your twitter they can find the code for that right they can yes if you want to hire billy ray you can do so uh and there's a, a whole load of interesting stuff around that now they've, they've added to it as well so you are always able to hire the hire other people's pawns and then when you send them back 
uh, you can give them a gift, which they will then take back to that player. Mm. Quite often, people just send each other like rotten fish or like just just yeah. any old bit of tap. But uh, you can you know be kind if you want to. Uh, but they've now also added a mechanic where you can set a quest for your own pawn and a reward for it for the player who helps your pawn to do that quest. Okay. So, for example, you can say kill a cyclops which is a sort of a, a mini boss you can encounter in the wild and if you do that you can have this item or this amount of gold you can set it yourself however much you want so that i think is partly to encourage people to pick your pawn out of uh, out of all the others because mm -hmm. um, if you're not selecting pawns by pawn code then you will just get a room full of like 10 of them randomly selected from the server and uh you just want to choose from that crowd. So I guess you right. want to make sure your pawn's the most appealing. Give it a good quest. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, uh, the the kind of the basics of, of character and stuff. Uh, other than uh, the fact that there are a number of classes um, that you uh, can select from for both yourself and for your pawn. Um, there's, uh, I can't remember the specific names, but there's like a, a fighter, a wizard, an archer, and a thief. Um, and they all have um, certain sets of weapon and armor that they can or can't use. Um, some can be used by multiple classes, some can't. Um, and this is where I've started to run into what I kind of feel like are some issues. Um, with the combat, it is quite interesting. There are a whole load of different skills and things you can learn for each of the classes and you can kind of assign them to like hotbar or, or like um, quick uh, shortcut buttons thing like you hold you hold L1 and press the face button right. to uh, do a certain attack um, but as a thief which is what I chose um, and I imagine as well as the warrior class you don't initially have any ranged attacks at all which is no problem at all when you're dealing with goblins or wolves or something like that but if a harpy flies at you mm -hmm. you just can't get it yourself right. now I'm sure that is to an extent, it's designed to encourage you to have a mixed selection of pawns in your team. Mm -hmm. And so you can get a, a wizard in or an archer and they will do some of that work for you. Yep. And it's then possible to ground any kind of flying attacker so that then the, the, the other, other people can move in and, and uh, deal with it. But um, the, the problem is that if you don't, if, if you're not very good AI friends aren't doing what you want them to do, mm -hmm. then you can't deal with these enemies very well. So I found that very frustrating. Now, I did eventually unlock an attack called Ensnare, where I can throw a rope at something, but you can't properly aim it, and it's difficult to hit. So I've really struggled with that. Um, I just think there's a lot of busy work in this game that is distracting from what could be a lot of fun. It looks fantastic, mm -hmm. and in many ways it plays very well when, when you're just doing the gameplay cycle of combat, climbing on great big monsters and stabbing them in the eye and you know having a lot of fun doing all that kind of thing. But you do a lot of running around, and I know that's a, a, the, the controversy that has followed this game before its release about the lack of fast travel uh, yeah. or the limited fast travel. It's got to be boring, right? Boring it is boring. To have fast travel. I find it boring um, uh, that I can't just, uh, that I've got to run across the same place all the time. Because, you know, you're going back to the main city a lot. And so mm. it, you're always on these outskirts dealing with the same kinds of enemies. There's just goblins and harpies everywhere. Um, and, you know, do I want to spend consumable items to fast travel? What if I need those in an emergency situation? Mm -hmm. Like the, uh, the other day, I suddenly realized, oh, I need to stop playing right now. And I was like, well, I want to go and sleep at an inn before I turn the console off. I had to just use one of my fairy stones in order to get back to the city very quickly, yeah. um, which felt like a shame. But um, so as well as running around the same area a lot and dealing with a lot of the same enemies, your inventory just fills up with so much crap. And then you get over encumbered. And if you're over encumbered or even close to over encumbered and have a lot of stuff, you're moving slowly. You can't sprint for as long. I think it affects your attacks as well. So to me, as I'm going to get to in the big discussion at the end of this podcast, it feels like there is such a good foundation here for a very pretty looking game with some really interesting like enemy designs, uh, a, a compelling story so far from what I've experienced, and a really good USP in the pawn system. Mm -hmm. But then it's just so bogged down by, of course, the microtransaction contro controversy, the lack of fast travel, uh, and, and the overall kind of cycle of fill up your inventory with loads of stuff, 
run back and probably not run as fast as you ran out from here because you're yeah. so full of stuff. And so that I'm finding is, is really hampering the experience for me, which is a real shame. It's a shame. Um, and uh, just to add to that, I have also, although I've not had any bugs, I've experienced some uh, a lot of slowdown with particle effects. And if there are a lot of enemies nearby, um, that is that is you know affecting the experience as well. So yeah, um, bit of a bit of an all over review there without touching on some of the stuff we're going to get to in the big discussion. But yeah, those are my my first impressions. Is that there's such a good foundation here, and I think it's been it's been sort of hampered by some of the experimental choices that have been made. Right, um, a bit stubborn in places. You think? Yeah, I think so, and it it just comes across as. <laughs> It feels like some stuff has been put in there purely to kind of slow you down, make you work harder, yeah. rather than to kind of add to the experience and just, oh, this is here to be really fun. It, it, I'm sure everything or most of the things were added with the intention of being fun, but it just doesn't come across like that all the time, mm -hmm. which is, I know I'm kind of in the minority there because this game was reviewed so well, particularly mm -hmm. before it was actually released. and. It, it was reviewed very well critically and has been received not quite as well commercially. Um, but yeah, so in that sense, I'm in a bit of a minority. But uh, yeah, I just, I kind of wish it had just lived up to what is quite clearly some huge potential. And it is by no means a bad game, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's quite as good as it could have been. Okay. Unfortunately. You're going to stick at it and see how you find it yeah, next I'm week? Yeah, I'm going to keep going and see how I get on. Um, and, you know, it might just be that I need to upgrade my character a bit more, get stronger, yeah. learn, you know, better, like, roots and things. And these are probably all the kinds of things they were trying to encourage. And mm -hmm. uh, But it's not so intuitive that it feels like, oh, here's what I need to do. Here's what they want me to do, the developers. Um, it, it just kind of feels like, oh, how am I going to overcome these obstacles they've just put in my way yeah. in, a, in an, an almost spiteful way, which, as I say, I'm sure that's not the intention, <laughs> but that's how it has been feeling to me this week. Well, that's a shame. It is a shame. Hopefully so I'm always it, looking forward to it. It picks up for you as you, as yeah, you play. Yeah, it's not a write-off, but um, it, it's not the best first impression, sadly. Wonderful. Um, the first game came out in 2012. 2012. Um, yeah, that Goodness was a me. PS3 360 era game, that one. Yeah. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, shall we move on to the forecast yes. for April? With Ashton. After three pretty stacked months in gaming, it's almost a delight that we've not got too much dropping in April. Though not too much is still not nothing. So there's still a few games I want to give you the lowdown on, they're coming out over the next 30 days. First up, launching on April 9th, is indie puzzler Botany Manor. Set in a Victorian English manor in 1890, you take on the role of botanist Arabella Green as she explores the grounds and gardens. The first-person puzzler focuses on the growing of fussy plants that require incredibly specific habitats, the clues for which you can find all over the house in paintings, postcards, letters, etc. Grow plants, solve puzzles and find out more about the career of Arabella and the issues she has overcome as a female scientist. Botany Manor launches on PC, Xbox and Switch. Next is 2.5D Metroidvania Tales of Kenzera Zao, a passion project from the voice of Bayek in Assassin's Creed Origins, Abu Bakar Salim. Inspired by the loss of Abu Bakar's father, the game follows a young shaman named Zao on his journey to capture three monster spirits as penance to the god of death in an attempt to bring his father back from the dead. The side-scrolling platformer features both up-close melee combat and ranged attacks to take down enemies and collect soul energy to purchase new skills. The beautiful-looking Tales of Kenzera Zhao launches on PC, Xbox, PlayStation and Switch on April 23rd. Another RPG out this year, and also out on April 23rd, is a Yuden Chronicle 100 Heroes. Part of the Suikoden series, 100 Heroes sees you playing as young Imperial officer Sane Kessling and their new friend Noah as they embark on a quest to find an artifact that will expand their empire's power. However, they are soon pulled into the fires of war and forced to reevaluate their beliefs. With your party of six, you'll fight your way across the land using the turn-based battle system in a beautiful 2.5D world. 
Ayudan Chronicles 100 Heroes launches on PC, Xbox, Switch and PlayStation. Next up we have action RPG Sandland, the third person adventure game based on the manga series of the same name. Launching on April 26th, you'll play as the fiend Prince Beelzebub and team up with his pals Thief and Sheriff Rao to find the legendary spring hidden in the desert. Using your demonic powers and very cool unlockable vehicles, you'll traverse the sands and build your base into a thriving city. The game features an art style incredibly similar to that of the OG manga, and looks to be a lot of fun for those who are fans of adventure, base building, or just being a little devil. Sandman launches on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. The last one I want to tell you about is PS5 exclusive Stellar Blade, formerly known as Project Eve, the third-person action-adventure launching on April 26th. You'll play as Eve, who's been deployed back to Earth to try and reclaim the planet for humanity through combat with a focus on attack patterns and precise timing. Eve meets Adam, who shows her the last surviving human city, Zion, and from there, with the help of people she's met along the way, she's off to save mankind from the alien Natiba. It looks to be one for fans of games like Nia, Bayonetta, and Rise of Ronin. Of course, that isn't everything. We have Sea of Thieves hitting PlayStation, Another Crab's Treasure launching on April 25th, and the Braid Anniversary Edition dropping at the end of the month. So have a wonderful time playing in April, and now it's time to get back to the podcast. It's time now for question two. Thanks, guys. What a great forecast. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Forecast it. Thanks, uh, thanks all three of us. Yeah, great job. I think we all do such a good job. Yeah. Uh, it's time for question two now. It comes from Chris McVeigh. Hi, Bap. With the news that Toy for, Toys for Bob have secured a deal with Xbox to make their first game as an independent studio, and the belief that whatever game it is will be presumably involve a Microsoft-owned IP, what do you think of rights holders giving indie studios a crack at making games in recognisable franchises? I realise that, in the event that this is Spyro 4 or something, it would be a bit of a stretch to call it an indie game given the studio and series existing history together, but I mean more in a Sonic Mania or Cadence of Hyrule sense. Do you think this sort of thing is a big break situation for indie developers, or are indie games better when they are when they get to create characters and worlds to call their own. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. This is where um, I think people uh, get a bit too black and white about what an indie studio is. Mm. I appreciate that it is an abbreviation of independent studio, and therefore, by that strict definition, it simply means one that is you know, not owned by a larger corporation. They just develop a game, and, and that's it. But, you know, and, and technically that's what Toys for Bob is now, right? They're, yeah. they're completely independent in terms of ownership. But if they're basically just going back to Activision slash Xbox and maybe even making Spyro 4, um, that's where I think there are some kind of gray areas where, uh, you know, it's, yeah, they are, they are indie by, by their nature, but it's probably going to turn out very similar to stuff they've worked on in the past, which I think is interesting. I Obviously, I hope it's Spyro 4, um, and there is perhaps some evidence to suggest that it could be, but absolutely nothing concrete. Um, but I think it would be silly not to be. It, yeah, it certainly would be. It's just whether, I guess, it, it ultimately comes down to whether Activision want to do a Spyro 4 mm. because Toys for Bob have said that they do want to do one. So that's that's probably where it, it's yeah. going to you know where it's going to come down to um but do uh do we see this sort of thing as a big break for indie developers um i i think that it it doesn't necessarily matter one way or the other uh whether they are working on something completely unique and and their own idea or if they are working for a big publisher as a kind of a third party i think uh as I feel like I often say with answering these questions on this podcast, it's very much case by case basis. Yeah. Um, you know, I think obviously there are some indie studios who have worked on some fantastic, very popular projects where it was just a completely unique idea. They came up with it themselves and maybe self published. Um, but likewise, there are some really good games out there where an indie studio was brought on by a bigger company to work on something that was, you know, licensed. I, I think it's very difficult to say more than that, really, um, other than I hope Toys for Bob do very well. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing what it is that they're doing. And if it does turn out to be not Spyro 4 and potentially not even anything that 
is already an Xbox or Activision IP. You know, this could be brand new IP. It's just under their their banner that they've decided to, you know, Activision or Xbox have decided to create some new character or a new game. Um, then, you know, Toys for Bob could still be making a mascot platformer or something that just happens to not be Spyro or Crash. So I'm, I'm just watching with bated breath. And that's, uh, that's all I think about this really is that I hope it's good. And uh, I, I don't think it matters necessarily um, the situation with, with indie studios and big publishers. I think it's somewhat beneficial to everyone for a big company like Microsoft to give an independent studio access to an IP because a lot of these IPs that are kind of held in the vaults, especially at Microsoft, even with like Embracer, which is the example of what not to do with an IP Mm -hmm. is give it to an indie studio with no money and then force them to push it out. Like was Gollum was definitely Embracer, wasn't it? Or was Gollum just... Yeah, I think so. I'll double check. Um, But yeah, I think that like there's a lot of examples obviously when it's gone wrong. However, I think that it's beneficial for a big developer or a big studio to give it to someone else because I think that if you've not got the time and energy and money to put into this because you're make, working on big blockbuster triple A's, mm. then why not give these smaller IPs, these existing franchises to trusted indie studios and see what they can do with it? Because as much as obviously it's nice to see new IPs form from indie studios. Lots of brilliant games have come out of indie studios like Chia and Kana and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more. But like you see these games that have done really well by indie studios and yeah, they've made some new things and it's great that they've got the creative license to do whatever they need to do. However, it's also great to see that these these franchises that maybe haven't been done anything with the last 10 years are finally getting a boost because they're being handed down to an indie studio rather than kept under lock and key of the off chance that big studio might decide to do something with it Mm. i think it's a good thing and i think that as much as you know you can see the negatives i choose to see the positives and i think that it it will be a good thing and hopefully spyro 4 maybe fingers crossed Mm. developed by daedalic published by nacon Oh, so it uh, wasn't. Uh, no, no. But they do have the Lord of the Rings rights. Yes, now. that's the thing. So, that's why yeah. I got confused. Yeah, um, yeah it varies, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think in the case of uh, specifically Toys for Bob, they more than earned the right to work on a Spyro mm-hmm. or a Crash, and yeah. I personally would like to see them do that. They could, uh, they could certainly make an you know a, an original mascot platformer yeah. and that will certainly find an audience but that's a really tough market it's not even necessarily a crowded one you know the likes of ukulele and a hat and time uh, have their fans mm. but they weren't big breakout successes and i think it would be a real shame if toys for bob didn't get to make their spyro game and they didn't get to make another crash game yeah i think no matter how because they're clearly good at that genre but i think no matter how good they did with a brand new one it's just not going to i think that that type of game nowadays only really sells on its like star power mm-hmm. or its nostalgia power i mm-hmm. i it's think a bit niche like nowadays, yeah it's it? it's niche and it's actually quite an old fashioned genre and the only reason or the main reason i think that the likes of spyro and crash have been doing well is because of who they are and if mm, you'd made yeah. exactly the same game but instead of a bandicoot it was a fox which she basically is it, it just wouldn't have done anywhere near as well as it did do. Mm-hmm. In terms of, you know, is it the right thing for an indie dev to make their own game or work on an existing IP? Um, I would love, just to pull an example out of thin air, to see Eric Barone make a, a Star Wars themed Stardew Valley game where you mm-hmm. where you just farm, but it's Star Wars licensed. I'd, I'd like to see that, sure. Mm-hmm. Would he like to make it? I don't know. Uh, would I prefer to see his haunted chocolatier thing that is wholly, you know, original? Probably a bit more. Yes, I would. And he would probably prefer to make that as well. But, you know, certain uh, developers have a real passion for these licenses and it might be a dream to work on them. I can't remember specifically off the top of the, my head the name of the veteran developer who was like a huge um, old school Disney fan. And then eventually he got the opportunity to work and, and make Epic Mickey. And that was like a dream come true for him. Um, you know, I, I, oh, I want to say Warren Spector, but I, that was, I look it up? yes, please. That is probably completely incorrect. I think he did 
Deus Ex. I don't know if it's the same guy. Anyway, I'm getting confused. But point is, some developers, whether they're independent or not, have a real passion for certain licenses. And if they get the opportunity to work on them, that could be just as much a passion project as something original would be. Mm -hmm. Also, work for hire More is a... Inspector. So I got it right. Yeah. yeah. Hooray. Um, work for hire is a very real thing that studios do. Sometimes they will, like I, I used to work for Splash Damage for a very short period of time and they did loads of work for hire stuff like the multiplayer for Gears of War um, and various other stuff as well. Uh, like Unreal Tournament stuff, not Unreal Tournament, um, Quake Wars, Enemy Territory or something like that. They mm. did some work for hire stuff so that they could finance some stuff that they made originally like Brink or, you know, uh, Dirty Bomb was another one that they made as well. Uh, so there's absolutely no shame in that and working on, on you know, with a license or a, or a big um, well-known IP is does provide something of a safety net. It's it's practically a guaranteed payday, even if it's not something you're passionate about. So I wouldn't begrudge an indie studio taking on a license because they have to, not even necessarily because they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, anything to prevent the layoffs and keep things afloat and then work on something that you are passionate about mm -hmm. potentially down yeah. the line. And so. as Ashton says, anything to get some of these IPs out of the prison that they're locked in <laughs> with some of these yeah. huge companies that are so big they don't even know what they've got probably you know mm. they're not even aware of some of the stuff they own absolutely like well, time splitters uh, yeah <laughs> yeah i wish there was like a list of well there probably is somewhere someone's done it like a list of everything that microsoft currently own because mm. now they've absorbed everyone i would like to know what they have yeah. that like is well, there. I've seen some speculation that Toys for Bob could make a good uh, Banjo Kazooie game as well, which yeah, I'm true. sure they could. That's but not what I'd like to see. Is Banjo Kazooie still relevant today? Well, That's again, the question. I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. No idea, but you know, Microsoft own more than just Activision's mascot platformers. Now mm -hmm. they they also own their own stuff, or well, not their own, but stuff that they've acquired elsewhere. Mm -hmm. mm. I think it makes sense to farm some of these IP out. You Absolutely. Know, there's a lot of stuff even Sony has that they just haven't touched, like since the PS3 era. Get someone working on a Resistance game that isn't a first yeah. party. You know, even if it's a flipping isometric tactical RPG or something, where mm. you you know, or a flipping what's it called, where you move your units about. Uh, what's that RTS? RTS? That's what I'm trying. Mm. The, my brain. It is not working. Um, <laughs> just like, just make something. Make keep this IP relevant. Well, you know, don't is, let it languish. Sony are really good at like finding a game that they think will launch really well, like Stray and Chia and Kana as like the three kind of the last few years examples, and finding a studio that's working on something really cool, bringing them under the the PlayStation umbrella and letting them do something really cool. And then they've got these brilliant studios that are part of their team that they could very easily palm off something on and mm -hmm. be like, can you do this, please? Because we don't want to. And we've seen what you can do. Yeah. There's loads of studios out there we've seen like the glimpse of greatness from them. And it mm -hmm. would be nice to see what else they can do yep. with something else. We're not selling any PlayStation VR 2 headsets. Hey, studio that exclusively makes VR games. It'd be great if you made a good game. But e <laughs> even if you don't, how about flat you make game. a flat, flat game. game? How about you make, uh, you know, an exclusive Warhawk VR game, you know? Mm -hmm. Remember Warhawk? I thought you were going to say Warhorse, like the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Warhorse. Yeah. I'm sure there is a Warhorse game maybe somewhere. Probably. That'd be a bit weird though if there if there was, right? Yeah, it would be a bit, and it would probably make the headlines, you yeah, know? Yeah, that would make it weird news. It's weird news time, time for some weird video game news. Remember, if you'd like to submit some weird video game news and get a shout out at this point in the podcast, then you need to put it under the relevant social media post that goes out on a Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, however, if you'd like to guarantee a shout out, you need to go to patreon.com forward slash team triple jump support us at the appropriate tier and become a podcast producer just like Chip Thompson's Thumbs, G.Y. Goliath, Nexus Polaris, Nicole Hansen, Kyle Gary, Andy Scott, Blake Thomas, Lucky Morris. I'm way too high. Shaman or Shaman Nomo. Great Giggity. Melody L. Bonnet. Katie Garrett. Gabrielle Philippink. Potato Shag 99. Eric Thew. And Big Money Bobby, Bobby Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> I like that even though we know that Ben is like having a brain mush day and, you, mm. and not feeling great, we're still like, we'll just let you do it. We'll let you <laughs> <laughs> get through this. What, the complicated intro? Yeah, all the bits hey, and pieces. Hey, I don't mind doing that... it if you want. No, I don't mind doing it, but I just like that we just, we watch Ben struggle. I'm professional. I it. only takes me six tries. <laughs> yeah. 
you uh, see you with, with this? It's with news time. Yeah. This was sent to me. No, no, it wasn't. It was sent <laughs> to the thread uh, by Gex at Snowy Boy Yanio Four on Twitter, um, and it's according to NintendoLife.com. <gasps> And I think it's random. It is. It's random. Um, It's written by Ollie Reynolds, who says, Random. Japanese police officer gets slapped wrist for playing Switch on duty. Then there's a good little quote in the subheading. I played games when there were few (laughs) when there were few incidents. Not no incidents, (laughs) just not many. Only some light muggings. Yeah. (laughs) We all know how easy it can be to lose ourselves in our Nintendo Switch from time to time. You might find yourself picking up something like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom mm. hyperlinked or <laughs> recently launched B- Balatro and have a genuine... Huh? What's Is that? Is that that card game that everyone loves? Maybe. I don't loves. Know. Let me Google it. Uh, and have the genuine intention to only play for around 10 or 15 minutes. Suddenly, it's 2 a.m. and your bladder is in dire need of some drainage. We've, oh, God. We've, Gross. We've Irrigation. We've been there. Yeah, For one is. Japanese police officer at the Tenri police station, however, time on the switch has unfortunately meant that his attention to his role has suffered, leading to a bit of a slapped wrist and docked pay via Japan News. Spanky bot bot. Indeed. <laughs> Spanky wrist wrist. In, according to the article, the officer played the switch a total of 10 times while on duty, with his total playtime adding up to a whopping 17 hours. Wow. Over how long? 10 times. 10 shifts. 17 oh, ten hours. Shifts. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, he had connected the Switch to a TV in the station's <laughs> oh, break room. He's not even playing it in handheld. But was ultimately caught during an unannounced inspection of duties. He admitted to wrongdoing and stated, I played games when there were few incidents. Oh, dear. <laughs> the prefectural police... Prefectural police. Yes, in right. Japan they have prefectures. It's like a uh, county. Oh, is it like a sort of, the, okay, yeah. like a region or something? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, has since confirmed that the officer's pay will be deducted in line with the amount of time spent playing the Switch. It just goes to show, no matter how awesome the Switch is, you shouldn't neglect your duties to play a bit of Nuh-uh. hyperlinked Princess Peach Showtime. And then in parentheses, we may make some money off this link yes. because it is affiliate, regardless of how tempting it may be. Thanks to Great Song for the tip. What did you make of the story from Japan? Was the employee treated fairly for his actions? Let us know. Ah. Do we? We don't know what he played. That's the most annoying thing. No, we don't. No, that's true. Probably Tears of the Kingdom. There are 46 yeah, comments. That's, that's a lot. And what do they think about it? Lol, this was me being caught playing my GBA under the covers at night when I was a kid. Yeah, it's very different though. Yeah, you're not, yeah. You weren't you're not actually in charge of yeah, Someone crime. underneath that, I think, very straight, I said... Don't do not do it while you're on duty. That's not okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, mate. That's good. I need good to know advice. what game he was playing before I can make any judgment. Yeah. Uh huh. I think so that's that the most true. important thing. Yeah. Yeah. He was playing um, The Last Hope. Oh, Dead, dead End. Dead la- End. Last the Last Hope. Oh, yeah. War Zeus God of Child. Yeah. Or whatever it is. I have some news that I found myself. Whoa, wow. And I picked it because of the drama. Ashton. Uh, it's from Nintendo Life by Liam Doolan. Random. Random. It's done. Every Super Mario Maker level has been cleared before the Wii U's online shutdown. The last what? unbeaten course was actually an illegitimate upload. <gasps> huh. Oh, so did they stop the uploads at some point? So then? once it goes offline, you won't be able to access all of the made... But if, he, if someone's played all of them, so there, so there was a few that weren't beaten. I don't like, think a single person's played them. It's all, just but... that someone's beat every single thing because a few of them okay. were unable to be beaten because they were so hard. I was just curious as to whether people can still upload levels because then surely there's even more levels there. I don't know. Played, right? Semantics, anyway. Yeah. Carry on. Earlier this week, we revealed how a trained f- task force dubbed Team Zero Percent, was attempting to complete every community level in the original Super Mario Maker game before the Nintendo shut down on before Nintendo shut down online functionality for the Wii U and 3DS on the 8th of April. While it was struggling to knock over one final level called Trimming the Herbs, since then the story has taken a bit of a turn, with the creator of this level confirming it was an illegitimate upload. Therefore, the final community level was in fact the last dance, which was cleared by Yamada SMM2 on the 15th of March 2024. 
This means every community level in the game has now been cleared. Mission complete. Hey. He is part of what the team behind this effort had to say in the update. Trimming the herbs was in fact a TAS, tool assisted speed run, making the last dance the final level cleared. To get to this point, the Mario Maker community had to knock over a whopping 25,000 unbeaten levels since Jesus. last October. It's once again a tremendous feat. Um, so yeah, they then there was a a tweet saying PSA in case you noticed a clear on trimming the herbs this clear is 100% confirmed by the mod team to be hacked we have been given written ev evidence from them admitting to cheating the first clear from a modded Wii U people will try to keep trying to give it a go so say basically the person who said that they've done it they lied okay. and they cheated which means that they haven't actually done all of the levels that's the last one left yeah. the most recently completed one was last dance from last month but um so that's all folks the shutdown of the wii u and the 3ds online services will take place next month in april if you've got the last minute things you want to do while the service is still active now is the time to boot up those old nintendo devices and do them yes um, does it not mean that they they have done all the ones that are humanly completable i i suspect my understanding of that is that the person who made the map, I think maybe you have to prove that it can be done well, this is before the... it's uploaded as, as oh, okay. beatable. Right. And they used a tool assisted speedrun yeah, to maybe. beat it the maybe first that's, time round. Yeah, that's what I thought, but it's a bit confusing mm. because um, we they say it's a tool assisted speedrun yeah. in the finishing. So I, I read that as they whoever did it cheated by using Yeah, tool I assist. thought that meant that whoever made it completed it with uh, a modded console mm -hmm. and because they completed it in air quotes it then gets like added to the store or the download right. page as beatable because yeah, it's being for quality beaten. control that yeah. would make sense right um, you have to beat it yourself and then because they've discovered oh wait it was uploaded as beatable but wasn't really it's not actually beatable then yeah. they, they realize oh that means we've done them all then because this last one that we were trying to beat is not actually beatable. Mm. You might be right. And um, also someone's saying that finding out that the the final level is voidable after days of attempting it is actually the lamest possible way to hit 100%. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, yeah. Technicality. Such yeah. an anti-climax, isn't it? It's like you did it, but you actually did it last, like a few weeks yeah. ago. But you we didn't realise when you did it. We didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's my weird news. Brilliant. Great stuff. I've got weird news as well. It comes from Amy Wicks. 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 Uh, this is from thegamer.com. A bunch of game devs gathered outside GDC, Game Developers Conference, to scream. Right. Cool. This is written by Rhiannon Bevan. The gaming industry is in a terrible state right now. Yeah. Just as we get some of the best games in living memory, the developers that make them are losing their jobs in endless layoffs. More than 10,000 jobs were cut in 2023. Sorry, in living memory? All the video gaming is in living memory. It's a very good point, yeah. <laughs> Not if you're dead. No. You played tennis for two? But you only have to be about 50 to have been around for all the video gaming. <laughs> That's true. Sorry, carry on. Maybe it's just a, th a thesaurus job for Rihanna. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where are we? More than 10,000 jobs were cut in 2023, a figure that industry executives are already close to surpassing in 2024. Meh, 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 meh. We're doing New it. Record. Zero percent speed run. It's so bad that it makes you want to scream. So that's exactly what some people did. At GDC this year, a bunch of game developers met up in one place and just screamed. Videos from the event are circulating online and the attendees certainly didn't hold back, screaming out in the open in pure frustration. Here we are. So that's um, it's a 20 second long video. Like, live art pieces people do yeah. in the street where they like paint themselves blue and stand next to a dead cow or something. Mm -hmm. I do love a bit of live art. Yeah. So I don't. The games <laughs> industry is falling apart around us and we're all flocking to San Francisco for a week to pretend like this is fine, reads the event's description. Let's take a minute where we all stop pretending and express just how it feels to be a game developer in 2024. I mean, that is pretty true, isn't um, it? Reactions yeah. to the scream, which was described as a moment of catharsis, camaraderie and caterwauling, are split. Many are sympathetic to the attendees, understanding why they need to let loose like this. Others feel like a, like uh, sorry. Others feel that a meeting of like-minded game devs could have been put to better use, oh, like planning unionization efforts or doing something more practical. With that said, anyone screaming about the state of the industry is probably pro-union too, and we are seeing an increasing uh, number of workers 
join or organize unions themselves. It then continues to talk about GDC. Um, but yeah, let them scream. I don't imagine they were screaming all day. No. It's probably their lunch break. For like a few minutes, yeah. Yeah, go outside, have a little bit of a scream. And they got their headline. They did? That's yeah, what they were going the for. Mm -hmm. Of the gamer. I hope they all Not feel and. better no. because of it. You know? Yeah. yeah it's I, nice to I, have, I it's good so to have too. a cry. It's good to have a scream. It is. Probably a big public scream feels even better than a yeah. private little scream in your bedroom. I feel Super like if scream. you were like wanting to go and have like a good scream, you just got to go to like a cliff mm. out, out into the sea and just scream into the ocean. Yeah. yeah. That's like the best place to or scream. In the desert. Be nice. yeah. yeah. It's like those um, smash rooms where you can go and like yeah. smash loads of plates and stuff. And TVs and whatnot. Let it out. Yeah. It's healthy. Well, it's time, everyone. For the big discussion. Uh... <laughs> big discussion time. Time for the big video game discussion that this week comes courtesy of Robert Golding. Robert says, Hi, Bap. Hi. Hi. With the release of Dragon's Dogma 2 to great reviews and the news that Capcom were the highest rated company on Metacritic for 2023, it looked like they were off to the races this year too. However, with the news coming out that the PC launch of Dragon's Dogma 2 is full of microtransactions for elements such as purchasable extra fast travel consumables, something that the creators of Dragon's Dogma 2 had stated was due to fast travel being only an issue because your game is boring, is this a sign that Capcom are on a slippery slope which other publishers are no doubt going to follow where <sighs> follow where key consumables of the game are essentially locked behind a paywall unless you get very good luck with in-game drops. This feels frankly disgusting in a game that showed a strange pride in not having readily available fast travel. And it makes me question if they were pushed into it by Capcom and posi positioned it as a creative decision to try and hide the plans to nickel and dime people. Mm. I'm about to cough. Would you mind one of you reading that? Go for it, sure. <coughs> this, so is, this is according to Willa Rowe from Kotaku. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, the sequel to Capcom's 2012 cult RPG, is out now, and critics have been raving about the game's expansive world and intricate systems. But some fans that have purchased the game aren't too happy, and on Steam, user reviews currently have it sitting at a rating of mixed. This, uh, the cause for uh, many of the more negative responses to the game lie in its microtransactions. Mm -hmm. There are 21 pieces of DLC for the game that are considered microtransactions, giving players access to items like life-restoring wake stones, currency in the form of rift crystals, and even the ability to edit your character's appearance. The prices of each... Can micro you not edit your character's appearance? You can, you can do all of these things in-game like, at a cost. Right, uh, like it's it's an item that you have to purchase with in-game currency. Um, same with these like wake stones and and various things, but you can just pay real money to just get it instantly. Right, is is how it works here. The prices of each microtransaction range from ninety nine cents to four dollars ninety nine. The biggest complaints from those who purchased the game have come down to the existence of these microtransactions in a full price single player game. The idea that this is a pay to win tactic and that it la uh, locks important customization features behind a paywall. I don't think that's strictly true. Um, Capcom issued a response to these concerns and other criticisms on Steam on March 22nd. The post addresses concerns about crashes and bugs, but a large section is devoted to paid DLC. Capcom reminds players that the majority of the items available to purchase as microtransactions are also uh, available to be obtained in-game. So that's the majority, not all. Mm. But Thank you very much. You uh, just to follow up on the um, customization paywall thing, that is a bit misleading, but I think because there has been a further story now where those items that you need to fully customize mm. your character again are very limited in game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, there's an unlimited supply if you have actual money. Mm -hmm. They have now updated that so there's like a capacity of 99 in any particular vendor. So you can, while you will still have to grind to yeah. purchase them yourselves, there's not a finite supply of them in game anymore, mm -hmm. which is the correct decision, I think. Then. Yeah. Peter, you've actually played Dragon's Dogma 2. I have. Uh, you, we spoke about it earlier on. We did. How are you finding it in, in regards to this stuff? Well... To look behind the curtain, we've not recorded that review corner yet, so I don't know what I just said. Okay. So I don't want to cover too much <laughs> ground again, but uh, I am finding it like kind of disappointing in a way. I feel like there is a game here that should just be really good and fun, and it's like a bit bogged down in what sometimes feels a bit 
kind of pretentious. I don't know if that's just because we've had that quote now about how fast travel is mm -hmm. only needed in games that are boring. And mm -hmm. now I can't get that attitude out of my head that these developers are maybe a bit on their high horse about how great their game is. But every time the game does something that just kind of inconveniences me, it makes me feel really bitter and like they're just doing it on purpose mm -hmm. to like not not challenge me in a constructive way, but just to like actively hinder me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's a PR issue as much as a development issue. I think like mm -hmm. the way they've handled this it makes it really difficult. Um, they are backpedaling on some of these things now, as you've said already, Ben, about like the customization items. Um, they also, the game launched with no option to either have multiple saves on the go, multiple characters on the go, which was news to me when I came to stream it. Well, not literally when I was live, but before I streamed, I realized, oh, I can't start a separate story. Like I was, it was a couple of hours in from my home story playthrough mm. and I was like, oh, this isn't going to be very good for the people watching at home as I just launch into the middle of a story. Mm -hmm. So that was annoying. Um, and you can't even overwrite the save of your one game to uh, start again. The game is unrestartable. Oh. So once you've started it, if you regret some of the decisions you've made, or if you've like killed NPCs that are killable and might be important for quests, you can't restart the game. Except now you can because people complained about this, yeah. and uh, it's being it's another thing they're backpedaling on. So. Basically, I think they've they've done some things here that were in some so I think some of them were maybe risks from a kind of creative perspective and they were trying to do interesting things. And, uh, you know, there's this the, the thing that bothers me the most is an example of that, where there is this in-game disease that, oh, yeah. that the pawns can get. Yeah. And it can be brought into your world when you hire someone else's pawn or yours can just contract it if they're fighting a dragon. And if you don't realize that any pawn in your party has this disease and you leave it too long, if you go to sleep in an inn, when you wake up in the morning, they have turned into a big demon dragon and killed every single person in town, including important NPCs. And that, I think, was done, you know, not for any kind of commercial or microtransaction related reason i think that was just done to be like oh isn't this an interesting new mm -hmm. unique thing mm -hmm. and the existence of these wake stones does allow you to bring back dead people but you know then you are in microtransaction territory if there's a bunch of dead characters in the world and you want to bring them back maybe you, you're gonna have to you, you need to either go and grind or you need to start spending money so some stuff is like stuff you know they've they've gone for like an interesting concept and i think it's not worked and then other stuff just feels like kind of a bit flippy to, to yeah uh you know the microtransaction stuff especially when they've said that basically fast travel is boring and no one should want to do it and uh you know if you want to do it, it's going to cost you two pounds well yeah it's like you only need it in a game that's bad so we don't have it in our game except we do but we're going to also you except for it. if you want to use it, we're going to charge Which is you for way it. Way worse, yeah. yeah, so much worse. It is. Well, this is the, that's kind of the energy is like it's just baffling as to why they've done this. Like some full price games, yeah, they do have microtransactions, but normally they're like a cosmetic or an additional weapon that you can get. That if you really, really like the game, you can spend money on it, and it doesn't benefit you in any way other than looking cooler. But the fact that like they've they've stuffed fast travel and like resettable things and customization under another set of payments is absolutely insane thing to do and i can't fathom somebody doing that like setting that up as the the process of what they're going to do and no one in the room saying that's not going to go down well mm -hmm. you, we shouldn't do this because as much as you want to make maybe an extra 20 quid off people in these microtransactions everyone is gonna think that you are a scumbag if you do that and i think that unfortunately no one seems to get their point across enough where they didn't do this because this is all i've really heard about dragon's dogma 2 other people said it's really good and i've seen people like enjoying it but from most of the discourse has been about 
these microtransactions and the things that you can't do in Dragon's Dogma 2 are not about like all the cool things that you can do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they've shot themselves in the foot a little bit with this. And I hope that people seeing the reaction that people have had to these microtransactions will stop anyone else doing something similar. Yeah, to answer the question, I, I don't think this is necessarily... Um, the start of like loads of companies doing this. I, I would like to think that they will see how people are reacting to this and, mm. and maybe think, okay, yeah, let's not do that. There are many ways you can add microtransactions to your game, as you said, Ashton, that are still going to make you money, but not seem quite as bad as what has been done here. So mm. hopefully, you know, if microtransactions have to continue, which I think they unfortunately do, they will at least be done in a different way. Um, the difficult thing here as well is like, Normally, something like being able to buy Rift Crystals, which is the in-game, not currency in the sense of gold pieces, but you know a separate currency, mm -hmm. um, that might be the kind of thing that you would expect to be uh, a microtransaction in a game. However, the whole USP of Dragon's Dogma is the pawn system, and you hire other people's pawns and make a little party. Um, but to hire certain pawns costs Rift Crystals. So that, again, feels like... Can you get Rift Crystals in-game? Yeah, you do. You get them in-game. Like, you earn them. But I've not earned, like... I'm not earning them super quickly. I've not yet come into a, a situation where I don't have enough. And it may well be that I won't ever come into the, that situation. Mm. But I can't say that for sure. And again, it just feels a little bit like you're semi paywalling your USP. Yeah. So, again, I'm not, I'm not really sure about if, if, in this instance, even microtransactions for rift crystals works so it's a shame yeah it's it's really bizarre i don't know i mean i would be shocked and disappointed if the director who said the famous thing about fast travel was involved in the decision to add microtransactions yeah. because it certainly seemed whether you agree with him or not and i think most people didn't was that he had a very specific creative vision for this game mm -hmm. and regardless putting putting aside to one side for a second how scummy it is that you you're charging for these for these optional things yeah it also like if people take you up on it completely like root not necessarily ruins but like it 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 destroys the the creative path that you were trying to to, to lay yeah. out. Yeah. Really struggled to find the words to put in front of each other there, like the Wallace and Gromit bit where he's putting the track down. Yeah. Like my brain is like, what are the words that come after this one? I don't know. I don't know what they are. Anyway, yeah, these things are finally balanced by developers when yeah, they're creating exactly. like, oh, we need to make sure that only and so many he rifts dug his heels in and made a really stupid point. It's like this guy, you know, he knows what he wants this game to be. To offer these microtransactions is to completely undermine that. Mm -hmm. And like, why, yeah. why would you do that? So this has got to be a decision made by on a publisher level rather than a development level yeah. and that sucks i feel sorry for them if that is the case because th it does make them look stupid mm -hmm. and this game is by all accounts fantastic and it will always have an asterisk next to it now yeah because of this silly decision and you can earn the stuff in game and that is true and that so far has been their only defense because they did apologize for some of the bugs and yeah. some of the you know issues that people had with it but when it came to this stuff the stuff people were really complaining about they just said well, you know, you can earn all that stuff in game. And then apparently they just put a, stuck a link in for people to buy it, mm -hmm. buy the stuff. And it's yeah. like, you are, it's so tone deaf. And it is a shame because Capcom have been absolutely yeah. smashing it. This ultimately, unless you take them up on it, will not ruin your experience of the game because you will still be able to play through it as intended without this stuff. It is optional, mm -hmm. but it sucks that it's there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's such a, such a self-own that was yeah. unnecessary. And for Capcom know? as well, who've been doing so well recently. I mean, yeah. as as it said there, Metacritic, you know, the highest rated uh, video game company on Metacritic for 2023. And they've been mostly knocking out the park with their resis over the past several years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to bring this out now is is a real shame. Yeah. I didn't think about the how they've undermined themselves quite as much, but it's a good point. Like even with the... The thing that you can't, you can only have one save and you can't rewrite it. If you're then going to be like, but if you pay two pounds, you can go back and like mm. do it again. Yeah. It's a bit like if Dark Souls said, oh, we'll lower the difficulty for a fiver. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on. A, surely in a lower difficulty Dark Souls defeats the entire point of Dark Souls. Yeah. And B, your whole thing is that it's hard. Yeah. 
it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. They have, as I said, they've they've you you can now or you're about they're going to add the ability to restart the game. That's um, good. And that was never a microtransaction in the first place. It was just impossible to do. Um, until you get to the end, and there's like a there's like the option for either new game plus or new game, but you have to roll credits on the game mm -hmm. to at the moment. Uh, time of recording to mm. restart. Sure, Crazy. it's a phenomenal game right now, per the reviews, etc. But this is uh, yet another case of maybe don't pre-order, maybe wait mm. a few months because yeah. come Christmas time there will be a definitive version of this game yeah. where yeah. everything that is perceived to be wrong with it will be fixed. Mm. It's so. such a shame how many games it feels like have come out recently. And despite being good games, have tarnished their own reputation with just like unsurmountable greed that's just being pumped out by all of the, the not all of them, but many of the publishers and higher ups just, just shafting their own great games by mm. doing stuff like this. Especially if they then react to it and, and go on to fix some of the issues later down the line, because then the ship sailed, you know, mm -hmm. as, as we said, I think last week, uh, Battlefront, it, no matter what they do now to fix their servers, which is the main issue, like, uh, all right, there are a few actual bugs with the game, even even offline, but the main problem is multiplayer. If they fix that, it's too late. Like, they've yeah. missed the that, that first window of a couple of weeks where if it had been really good, so many people would have been in there playing it night after night, you know, with their friends, enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. It can be too little too late, unfortunately, if uh, you fix it, even if you do fix these things down the line. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, let us know what you think about everything we discussed today. We'd be interested in your feedback. Thank you so much for listening slash watching. Hey, um, hey, just be nice in the comments. It's a big ask. Please. Be nice. It's a big ask. Uh, Peter's going to tell you a couple of places you can find us right now. You can find us on youtube.com and twitch.tv, both forward slash team triple jump. Our videos go out on YouTube and our live streams happen over on Twitch. And hey, if you've got Amazon Prime, you're paying for a whole bundle of things, including a Twitch sub. So if you redeem that against us at no extra cost, you will get all the benefits of being a Twitch sub without paying anything on top of what you're already paying for Amazon Prime. We are on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram, on all of which we are at Team Triple Jump. And if you want to become a patron and support us, it's patreon.com forward slash Team Triple Jump. Triple Jump is our website. That's where you can find links to everything that we do. And why not leave us a five-star review on your platform of choice? It helps something to do with Al Gore's rhythms and would really bloody appreciate it, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, it's time for our sponsor yet again, which is, of course, a the combined efforts of Brill Cream, the Team GB Olympic <laughs> diving team, and Hell Divers 2, mm -hmm. or Arrowhead Studios, I should say. It's Gel Divers 2, coming soon to Hell Divers 2, where you jump off a structure into a schlorp of gel, and uh, oh. Tom Daly goes... 10. Great, That's great a 10. Job. Does Tom then jump in or? No. No, because he's retired. He's retired he, he doesn't yeah. go near diving boards anymore. Anyway. No. He can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. He'll like, it's like a, a devil, a demon going into church or something. Yeah, it just yeah. like fizzle up. So. At least if you did come out and didn't drown, your hair would look great. You would. You'd get that wet look yeah. all day, all over you. <laughs> Forever. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.